Creator, may your spirit and guidance be in us as we work for the benefit of all of our people, for peace and justice in our land, and for the constant recognition and di of the dignity and aspirations of those whom we serve. <clears throat> Minister statements. Minister statements. Honorable Premier. Mr. Speaker, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be back in the House for the fall sitting of the 19th Legislative Assembly. Mr. Speaker, just over three years ago, many of us were elected to this House to represent residents in constituencies across the territory. With just under one year remaining in the life of this government, we have much to accomplish. I look forward to working collaboratively and respectfully to ensure we make the best decisions for the Northwest Territories. This means ensuring future legislative assemblies are in a good position to continue to make progress on some of the important work we have and will achieve in this government. The past three years have been like no other experienced by previous legislative assemblies in the Northwest Territories or by governments around the world. The first global pandemic in over a century required us to shift our focus Mr. Speaker, we prioritize the need to protect the health and well-being of residents and communities ahead of the mandate we had set mere months before the COVID-19 pandemic was declared in March 2020. While government resources were mobilized to support our pandemic response, not only from a health perspective, but also from a social and economic perspective, the regular business of government could not and did not stop because of the pandemic. We continue to work on the 22 priorities outlined in the mandate of the Government of the Northwest Territories. Some areas move more quickly than others, but the work continued to be advanced. I am extremely grateful for the many public servants who have supported this work over the last three years. Your collective efforts and dedication will have long-lasting impacts on residents. Mr. Speaker, people are a priority. As a government, we are focused on making sure all residents have what they need to thrive. This includes food, shelter, financial security, and health care. <coughs> the gaps we experienced in the North were exas exasperated by the pandemic, and it became evident that we needed a plan to move forward with our social and economic recovery post-pandemic that was complementary to the priorities outlined in the mandate. Emerging Stronger, our plan for social and economic recovery post-pandemic is an extension of our mandate priorities and offers a roadmap on how we can address the gaps that the pandemic brought to the forefront. Mr. Speaker, we, we remain focused on advancing this work, along with the priorities outlined in the mandate. Since February, we've had a 6.9% increase in fulfilled commitments, and I am confident that we remain on track to meet most of the commitments, including delivering on our commitment to deliver 100 new housing units across the territory, the largest increase in new housing stock in decades. Over the course of this sitting, you will hear from ministers about the work that continues to be done to bring stability and improve pros prosperity to residents and communities of the Northwest Territories. As life began to return to a new post-pandemic post normal early, earlier this year, the world was thrust into uncertainty when Russia invaded Ukraine, bringing with it geopolitical instability that has had an impact on nations around the world, including Canada. Mr. Speaker, costs continue to rise, and inflation in Canada reached a 40-year high this past summer. We know residents are feeling this in their pocketbooks as groceries, gasoline, home heating fuel increases, 
continue to raise an already high cost of living for Northerners. It's having a particularly significant impact on middle and lower class residents. Those living paycheck to paycheck or who are on a fixed income, like those living with disabilities or seniors, are having to make difficult decisions about which bills they can pay and still put food on the table each month. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that it is expensive to live in the Northwest Territories. We continue to do what we can for the most vulnerable residents during this difficult time. As a result of the geopolitical instability, there has also been a renewed focus on Arctic sovereignty and security. As I've said before, Northern security is not just about robust military presence. It is mostly about building strong, resilient communities through significant investment in critical infrastructure like roads, ports, telecommunications, and energy. This was part of my message last week when I attended the Arctic Circle Assembly in Reykjavik, Iceland. Global powers are moving fast to extend their influence and control in the Arctic through massive investments, increased marine traffic, and partnerships to advance Arctic projects and positioning these countries are ramping up their Arctic presence and level activity within their borders and across the circumpolar world. Mr. Speaker, the, this is an effort to both secure opportunities for themselves and to influence the international rules and policies that will set the terms for what happens in the Arctic. It is time for Canada to undertake bold new nation-building projects in partnership with the territorial governments and northern indigenous governments that will allow all Canadians to benefit from the opportunities in the north. We want to be part of this work. Northerners need to be at the decision-making table, and I applaud Canada for its work with territorial governments and indigenous leadership at regional and national tables for the Arctic and Northern Policy Framework. Developed with all three Northern Territories, the Arctic and Northern Policy Framework sets a roadmap to make the North stronger and more resilient through strategic investments to close the gaps between Canada and its Northern Territories. Late last month, Cabinet met for three days with Indigenous leadership as part of the Council of Leaders table, and it was clear that increased funding is needed in the Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, securing investments and support from federal partners on the priorities we have outlined in the Arctic and Northern Policy Framework is critical to our future success in the Northwest Territories and the future success of Canada. We cannot continue to be an afterthought as a contributing part of Canada's economic future. If action is not taken now, we will be left behind as the federal government moves forward with its vision for a stronger Canada. This past summer, Minister Wozniak and I attended the Prospectors and Developers Association Conference in Toronto to meet with industry and other stakeholders to talk about the resource development opportunities that exist in the Northwest Territories. What struck me during our time there was the number of political leaders from all stripes in attendance alongside Indigenous leaders from across Canada. The geopolitical landscape is in turmoil, and given its unpredictable nature, it is likely to face instability like this in the future. The federal government sees this and their plan to deliver billions in funding to support the critical mineral sector bodes well for the Northwest Territories. We have a lot of opportunity to be, be a green energy leader in Canada. However, to turn our critical mineral potential into a reality, we need the federal government to make good on large-scale investment. The federal government has committed to aligning Canada's electrical, electricity system with its climate goals of net zero by 2035 and a recent report by the Canadian Climate Institute says significant changes are required to every aspect of the provincial and territorial power generation and distribution systems to meet the future demand. 
The Tolson Hydro expansion can be a significant project that will advance Canada's clean energy goals. Mr. Speaker, Canadians want to buy electric vehicles, but due to supply chain challenges, they are waiting months and sometimes years to get one. Investment in infrastructure projects will play a significant role in the Northwest Territories' economic recovery, while also supporting national climate change goals, including significantly increasing the number of electric vehicles on Canadian roads. <coughs> By investing in large-scale projects like the Tolson Hydro Expansion, Mackenzie Valley Highway, and Slave Geological Quarter, it will bridge the substantial infrastructure gap that exists here in the Northwest Territories, kickstart the territory's economic recovery, and help improve access to the territory's critical mineral potential. When it comes to climate change, these type of investments are needed to help the Northwest Territories to mitigate and adapt to climate change and will also act as significant economic drivers for our territory. For the Northwest Territories to meet our climate change mitigation and adaptation objectives, we need renewed energy, community and transportation infrastructure. We need to increase the use of alternative and renewable, en renewable energies in a manner that is affordable, reliable and sustainable. This cannot happen without the support of the federal government. Investment is critical to achieving these goals. This type of investment in the territory will bring with it economic prosperity. Residents want jobs. They want to be able to provide for their families, to be able to have a quality of life that gives them a better chance of success. By balancing our social investments with the need for economic well-being, we are set setting residents up for a brighter future. We are in a unique position to build on the economic foundation that has provided so much to residents for many decades while planning for a future where Northerners will have more educational and economic opportunities available to them. Mr. Speaker, the pandemic created many challenges for us, but at the same time, it gave us the opportunity to look inward and begin to carve a new path forward for the Northwest Territories. It will take time and will be part of the next government's work. But I am confident we're in a position where the hard work we've put in since coming to, into office in 2019 will pay off for generations to come. Message out, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Premier. Minister statements, minister statements, member statements, member statements, member for here or so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, dredging. Mr. Speaker, last week I spoke about the importance of dredging the Hay River Harbour. Subsequently, I went home on the weekend and yesterday I witnessed a grounded Coast Guard vessel again outside the mouth of the Hay River being towed off a sandbar by MTS vessels. Mr. Speaker, the statement made was followed up with questions to the Minister of Infrastructure on what it is her department is doing to ensure the Hay River Harbour is dredged prior to next season. After reviewing the answers received from that line of questioning, I can confidently con conclude that her department, this government and the federal government do not understand why dredging is significant to the community of Hay River and the Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, we are assuming the obstacle for dredging is who is, respons who is responsible, when really we are talking about who is willing to pay. It always comes down to money. If this government wants federal support and access to funds, then we must do our homework and present a, a solid business case for dredging. After reviewing Hansard and other government documents over the weekend, the efforts of this and past infrastructure ministers has been deficient. We cannot continue to go hat in hand to the federal government asking for assistance with no justification. And that is why we continually get the door slammed in our face. Mr. Speaker, a 1995 Federal Standing Committee on Transport stated, and I quote, ports where there may be justification for, conti for continuing federal presence and support include remote sites, particularly in the Arctic, 
which support marine resupply operations that are critical to the survival of remote and isolated communities, some of which are associated with constitutional obligations. A later federal report on the Standing Committee on Fisheries and Oceans states that safe, ask, uh, and I quote, safe access to harbours depends on adequate water depth at all times. And that's why we get stuck, because we don't have adequate water depth. And further on states that annual dredging is part of the maintenance and repair obligations of the small craft harbour program, as dredging is often considered essential to harbour operations. It is usually the priority. From those reports, you can see there is a path for federal support for dredging in the NWT. Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to conclude my statement. Thank you, Member for Haver South. The members seeking unanimous consent to conclude a statement. Are there any nays? There are no nays. You may conclude your statement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when I talk dredging for the Hay River Harbour, it is not only for the community of Hay River, but it is for the benefit of the whole of the Northwest Territories. It is essential that we have a well-maintained and navigable harbour, not only for the safety and navigation of vessels, but tied to the many issues we discuss in this House that include community resupply, food security, cost of living, housing, climate change, resource development, financial costs, search and rescue, flooding, maintaining a northern transportation corridor, indigenous rights, Arctic sovereignty, truth and reconciliation, and more. Mr. Mr. Speaker, we need this government in consultation and cooperation with indigenous governments to develop a business case for dredging the Hay River Harbour and Channel, and to do the same for those points along the Mackenzie River and Arctic Harbours that would require similar dredging supports. Mr. Speaker, I'll have questions for the Minister of Infrastructure later. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Haver South. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Nukput. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The importance of community resupply has been spoken of in this House many times. It's been publicly stated private barging contracts will not take priority over essential community resupply services. In 2016, the GNWT took over operations in the Marine Transportation Services when the GNWT took over MTS. It assured public and elected officials in the communities to remain priority service. The Minister assured us in this House that private contracts, barging services, would not impact the GNWT, the ability to resupply NWT communities with fuel and fuel food. In fact, the department recently purchased larger barges. MTS stated the new barges will provide us the opportunity to travel once each year of the communities, providing them with the debt cargo and their entire quantity of petroleum products for that year. These barges, uh, these newer barges, Mr. Speaker, were, um, were expected to provide an operational savings and reduce the risk of oil spill. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the new barges purchased MTS did not help the community of Saks Harbor this year. Mr. Speaker, the GNWT has waited once again till the end of the season, shipping season, to provide essential fuel, fuel and uh, cargo for the communities. We don't have uh, to look uh, too far to remember back the first time Minister of Infrastructure has failed to deliver the promise in the community resupply in 2018. While shelves in the communities developing MTS cancelled the barge resupply to Paltuck due to impassable ice, Mr. Speaker, that the GNWT did ensure that uh, this never happens again. I quote the Mayor of Paltuck at the time he said the community was never given clear delivery date besides the original forecast in the barge to arrive early September. Now, Mr. Speaker, four years later, we find ourselves in the same situation. It is now October. Why in the GNWT is waiting for the communities till the end of the barging season? How is it possible to de uh, for the department can deliver on contracts all through the summer of the barging season and do NWT communities in the high Arctic we pay the price. I will have questions from the Minister at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Shame. Thank you, Member for Nanakput. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
As the Minister of Infrastructure, in June of 2020, I announced $15 million in funding from the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program to advance the Prohibition Creek Access Road. The scope of this project included planning activities, as well as the construction of approximately 13 kilometres of all-season road from Canyon Creek to Prohibition Creek along the existing Mackenzie Valley Winter Road alignment. My department and I decided to issue this contract for open tender, or an RFT, just months before my removal from Cabinet in September of 2020. One year later, in October 2021, infrastructure finally initiated the public procurement process for the construction of Prohibition Creek. A single construction bid was received at a significantly higher cost, 69% greater than the funds publicly announced as available for the work. Rationale for the escalated costs included substantial increases due to supply chain issues resulting from the pandemic. This wouldn't have been a factor had the road been issued for tender when I had given the order to my department. This leads me to ask, Mr. Speaker, what happened between June of 2020 and October of 2021 to delay issuing this RFT? Currently, the department is working with Infrastructure Canada to secure a total of $25.5 million in funding and has changed the scope of work to only 6.7 kilometres of road between Canyon Creek and Christina Creek. Mr. Speaker, rumours are swirling around the saw too that this won't even include the cost of fuel for the project. Add in the GNWT's portion and we're talking about $30 to $35 million for 6.7 kilometres of road. I should quit this assembly, Mr. Speaker, and get into the road construction business if it's that lucrative. And the icing on the cake, Mr. Speaker, is the Minister of Infrastructure has informed me that it is now going to be a negotiated contract. And not only will the minimum $30 million contract be negotiated, it's being given to a private company in Norman Wells, not a development corporation or other such Indigenous entity as is usually the case for negotiated contracts. Furthermore, this is a company that supported a member of Cabinet during the election, at least according to what the people from the Sawtoo have been telling me since I took office. In an email dated October 6, I was informed by Minister Archie that the Minister of Housing has endorsed this private business in a written letter submitted with their ask. I will be tabling that email later today, Mr. Speaker. This is unacceptable, and I ask, when are we going to stand up and start addressing the cronyism and corruption of the GNWT? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Great Slave. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Recent media reports indicate that the ANIC F2 telecommunications satellite, depended on by eight NWT communities, could fail as early as February of 2023. An onboard board failure of equipment means the satellite could be out of service three years sooner than anticipated, cutting off phone and internet services. Obviously, this disruption in service can't be allowed to happen. Not surprisingly, satellite failure will impact some of our smallest and remote communities that rely on satellite because they aren't or can't be looped into microwave, broadband, or fiber link networks. This reliance on satellites already poses big challenges for community organizations and members uh, faced with inc uh, incredibly low data speeds and correspondingly high usage charges. It's a Telesat Canada satellite, but the contractor and supplier of the service is Northwest Tel. The telecommunications firm is reported to be working on or working for Telesat for a workaround to maintain service. That could include temporary or permanent switchover to another satellite channel supplier, such as the current low Earth orbit OneWeb satellite, or signing on to the SpaceX Starlink system when it's up and running. There's a potential collateral benefit that switching to another provider could actually improve the service, hopefully by bolstering data speeds. Telesat is quoted in media reports as having said, quote, extensive mitigation strategies in place to, that they're going to have extensive mitigation strategies in place to ensure continuity of, of service by, quote, collaborating weekly with regulators and customers. It's hard to understand mitigation when it's a matter of service being there or not. As the potential February failure date approaches, I'm sure community customers are looking for reassurance and commitment from this government to make sure everything possible is being done to prevent even one day's outage. 
I'll have questions for the Minister of Finance on how this government is working on behalf of these communities to ensure continuity of telecommunications service, services when ANIC 2 crashes to earth. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Decho. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I recall a statement made by our past elders, and I share this speech at graduation ceremonies. The elders stated, we want good education for our children to become doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers, and nurses. Mr. Speaker, that statement speaks volumes of the expectations of our education system for our children of today and tomorrow. I'm saddened that not one Indigenous leader or group has made their views known of the current education system in the Northwest Territories and especially in the small communities. I'm equally saddened by the fact that the Education Department does not have updated and current statistics of the turmoil in our education systems in the outlying communities. This has been going on for quite some time. No attention paid to the small communities' education systems. I constantly hear that we, as leaders, are failing the education future of our children. Mr. Speaker, the university project has been pushed by this government without proper statistics to back it up. I'm not sure what they don't see failing in our small communities. We want world-class education facility, then let's concentrate on improving our education curriculum and education systems in the outlying communities. Merci. Thank you, Member for Detro. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Nivik Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I'm going to talk about the NTPC Crown Corporation, and I'm not going to reread my member statements from February 2020, February, uh, February 2021, or any, we, and also some anything from our internal briefing we had on February 2022 with NTPC. But I'd like to raise this issue again because here we are in the 19th Assembly when according to all of the stuff that I can find why we became how we had the Deputy Minister sitting as the board was when the past minister responsible for the Power Corp on May 11th announced that uh, the Power Corporation announced that saying the move was partially made due to the Power Corporation's reclassification as a government organization, meaning it's no longer operating at arm's length. And then in a minister's statement on June 8th, the Auditor General, he stated the Auditor General had recognized these changes and directed that the corporation be classified from a government business enterprise to another government organization. The corporation must now adhere to public sector accounting standards given these changes. And I believe that it's time for GNWT to consider the most appropriate future governance model for the corporation. And here we are in this third year of our assembly and we on this side of the house are still asking where is this governance model we haven't seen this governance model so mr speaker my questions today are going to be for the minister responsible for the northwest territories housing corporation thank you thank you member for nivik twin lakes member statements member statements member for yellowknife north Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this last weekend, uh, everyone in the territory got the bene benefit of uh, two holidays, giving us two four-day work weeks. And I, I had a number of people ask, you know, I'd, I'd really like to always have a four-day week work week. And well, Mr. Speaker, we could always have a four-day work week if us and this house wanted to. I've uh, I spoke of the benefits of a four-day work week before, Mr. Speaker, but today I want to present my plan of how we could actually accomplish this. First, I think you have to frame it as a recruitment and retention exercise. Uh, the Northwest Territories presently has the highest employment rate in Canada. Th that can be seen as a good thing, but we also know it comes with a labor shortage and many businesses are having a hard time finding people to work and keeping people working. 
certainly uh, a four-day work week would be a, a good incentive to that. Uh, firstly, Mr. Speaker, I must say that the, you know this has to be employee and employer driven. So if you're working, uh, if you're listening to this, you know maybe contact your employer, see if uh, you can change your work schedule. If you're in a union, maybe contact your union. But from our side, I think the first step would have to be bringing this to negotiations, Mr. Speaker. Now, I don't know if we could necessarily do a full reduction of a one day, but perhaps if we add an extra one hour a day, four days a week, we're actually only asking for a three and a half hour reduction over the whole week for our union. And I know that union's gonna be asking for some record pay increases given inflation, so uh, perhaps we can use a reduction in hours uh, to see some ones or zeros in that collective bargaining agreement. And then, Mr. Speaker, if we did this for the GNWT, you know what's gonna happen. Everyone in the private sector is going to lose it. They're going to say, oh, just another GNWT worker is getting more time off to do less work. So, Mr. Speaker, I think we need to get some private businesses on board, small and large. This is what they recently did in Iceland to implement a four-day work week. They got a number of companies to sign on through a number of incentives. Presently, we charge small businesses in this uh, territory 2% tax rate. Perhaps we could offer them 0% tax if they want to adopt a four-day work week. I think we'd get quite a few to sign on with that incentive, because no one likes paying taxes, Mr. Speaker. And then, Mr. Speaker, after a few years, I think you could, of incentives, you could maybe introduce the stick, which is the Employment Standards Act, and require lowering the number of hours required in a work week before overtime is required. And Mr. Speaker, I think if you did this with dedication, we could be one of the most attractive jurisdictions to work in the country and get people to come to the North and stay in the North because it would always be a long weekend here, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Tunaday Welladay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I just got back from uh, the community of Tuscane where I had a constituency meeting and um, it was very touching when I was in the community and housing still continued to be uh, a big issue in my community. I had a mother that come up to me crying and uh, looking for a place for her and her child that's couch surfing in the community. So um, also I want to talk about uh, this issue that I brought up back in March. Um, again, I just want to continue to speak on the housing in my riding of Tunaday Willity, because these <clears throat> these problems aren't going away, and what's been done simply isn't enough to meet the needs of my constituents. I want to remind the House of an issue I brought forward earlier this year, the case of uh, Mildred Lockhart, who uh, uh, there was a story done on CBC this year about her situation, and Miss Lockhart is also a single mother and have two uh, adult children. And um, she's also a cancer survivor. She's been battling cancer for a while and now she's in remission and uh, she really needs help. And uh, so I'm here to advocate for my constituents and especially her in our community if it's okay. Um, in this case, uh, <coughs> uh, Ms. Lockhart is also a resident of Hutsuke whose home is in terrible state of disrepair. Going on six years now, Every winter, Mildred finds sewage back up in her bathtub sinks, bathtub and the sink. Mildred must bail out upwards up to 16 buckets of five gallons of uh, pail a day. And that's over 300 liters of raw sewage backing up into her bathtub and, and sink. Just hearing about the situation will make even the strongest stomachs squeezing. But it's far worse when you see the pictures as I have, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Ms. Mildred has been idle. She's had sought help from the housing NWT through emergency repair program in March of this year. She was told her house income was too high to qualify her program. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, this story is just one of many in my writing of Indigenous people falling through the cracks of this government's policy. This, uh, despite ev efforts of those of my colleagues, the GNWT remains assigned by an excessive amount of red tape that prevents our constituents from getting the help they need. Furthermore, the nature of my riding is being unsettled and unceded First Nation traditional territory prevents the direct flow of resources from federal government of Canada to the Cato communities. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to seek the honest consent to conclude my statement. Thank you, Member for Tunaday Welde. The Member seeking unanimous consent to conclude a statement. Are there any nays? There are no nays. You may conclude your statement. Thank you, uh, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, <coughs> despite my efforts, 
of these of my colleagues again. Um, I want to emphasize that this is a very important issue in my writing. Furthermore, the nature of my writing being is unsettled, like I mentioned. Uh, there are $30 million available from housing projects by Ottawa, and yet we see barely a penny because of that. Of this money must go flow through the GMT, often inflexible bureaucrats' channels. Mr. Speaker, I have feelings <coughs> that if the office of NMT housing were knee deep in sewage backup, it will, wouldn't take the department long to find the money to fix the problem. All I am asking for is for the same comp compassion, flexibility to assault, resolve Mildred Lockhart's problem and to help so many more in, in all our communities in the North East Territories. Mr. Speaker, the responsible <coughs> The minister responsible for housing has the money, she has the staff, she has the policy. She doesn't have to move mountains to help Mildred in her time of need. And I must address the fact that since I raised this issue, months have passed without any changes to policy and procedures. Mr. Speaker, we, here we are as MLAs who serve our constituents not to defend the bureaucrats' status quo. I remain deeply saddened that this issue is so sub stubbornly uh, persistent in my work as an MLA. It leaves me with one question for the minister. There will be <coughs> this, this, sorry, will show she has a heart and do the right thing to help Major Lockhart. Mr. Speaker, I also have further up for, for more questions after this. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Tunde Well Day. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Mumfuyi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, today I want to talk about a very common problem that people, people facing evictions from public housing. Recently, I received a telephone call from one of my constituents who said, she was facing eviction over a $1,500 in arrears. The only money this person received is through the income support program. Mr. Speaker, I understand that the government of the Northwest Territories has a different programs in place to help with these types of problems, like the homeless, Homelessness Assistance Fund. More concerning is that some people have children and the eviction from their homes creates a child protection concerns that the, that the Department of Health and Social Services ends up dealing with. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I have been thinking about this situation. I have heard the minister acknowledge public housing units are social housing. I thought about it and I do not understand then why are we charging rent to low-income families in social housing in the first place. Mr. Speaker, housing NWT sends a bill that another department pays, like the Department of Education, Culture, and Employment. So why are we, why, so why <clears throat> we are paying GNWT bills with GNWT money? When the person does not agree to have it deducted from income support, they fall behind, and we end up dealing with it anyways. Mr. Speaker, I would like to know how much time the GNWT spends collecting housing arrears, and how much it costs to keep track of all these internal billings. It represents many hours of staff time, not only, not to mention the hours of time spent trying to collect $1,500 and legal costs and sheriff's costs in doing these evictions. Mr. Speaker, can I have a unanimous consent to conclude my statement? Thank you, Member for Mumfui. Member seeking unanimous consent to conclude her statement. Are there any nays? There are no nays. You may conclude your statement. Mr. Speaker, in this case, I am sure GNWT has thousands and thousands of dollars invested in collecting $1,500. And if the eviction goes forward, <clears throat> there is a good chance this becomes a child protection matter that will cost government of the Northwest Territories even more money. Mr. Speaker, I will have a question for the Minister of Housing at appropriate time. Thank you. 
Thank you, Member for Mumfui. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Nehende. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Raymond Ronnie Grostad was born on June 21st, 1973, in Fort Simpson. He passed away on May 13th, 2022, at the age of 49. When we heard that he had passed away, the family and friends were very shocked and saddened. Mr. Speaker, death has taken away a genuinely warm individual, more importantly, a loving uncle, brother, depriving so many of a good person. While the family and friends mourned the loss, they gathered in Fort Simpson, paid tribute, and celebrated life that was well lived. I can advise you that he left, left a lasting impression in the minds of his acquaintances and others. People knew him as a pleasant, cooperative, helpful, and dedicated individual. Mr. Speaker, Ronnie, through his decorum and grace, endeared himself to many. This is particularly a difficult and painful time for the family, and extending to them my heartfelt condolences. I wish them courage and strength to bear this irreversible loss. Mr. Speaker, Ronnie was truly enjoyed by his nieces and nephews. They made him feel special, and he was always excited to see them and help out where he could. Ronnie was preceded by his, his parents. Mr. Speaker, the, pe the family would like to thank everybody for their support during this difficult time. He will be forever missed by his surviving family and friends. We'll sadly miss him. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nahende. Your thoughts and prayers are with the family and community at this time. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Range Lake. Mr. Speaker, I rise today with the heaviest of hearts to deliver the statement on the passing of my dear friend, Alfred Moses. I had the privilege of working alongside Alfred as a cabinet minister in the 18th Legislative Assembly. Alfred was the type of person who would light up a room with his vibrant energy when he walked into it. Mr. Speaker, he carried the world on his back and took his role as minister seriously. As a lifelong northerner, Alfred was committed to helping improve the lives of residents however he could. Oftentimes, he'd be frustrated that he couldn't do more. He just wanted to see residents across the territories be successful in their lives. Alfred was your biggest champion before you even knew him. He would encourage those around him to chase their dreams, to live life to its fullest. He believed in hard work and dedicated much of his life to helping youth and improving the lives of residents, especially those most vulnerable. Alfred was loyal and cared deeply about anyone he encountered in his life, whether it was a constituent with concerns, a colleague who needed advice, or a stranger who stopped him on the street. Alfred was always there for those around him. Mr. Speaker, for eight years, Alfred represented his constituents of Boot Lake in Inuvik with honesty and integrity. He spoke fondly of the work he did as a regular member, especially his role in the establishment of anti-bullying legislation in the Northwest Territories. As an MLA, he put in countless hours on committees, traveling to communities across the territory to hear from residents. He was always willing to listen. As a minister, Alfred helped implement 911 in the Northwest Territories, along with junior kindergarten and a number of other important initiatives. He has left his mark on the territory in ways that many of us may not know. The impact that Alfred has had on the Northwest Territories is hard to define. Many of us knew him and I know that he lives on within all of us. He was inspiring, caring, <coughs> and had a deep connection to the North. He wanted to make it a better place for all. I, along with many others, will miss him greatly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Premier. Our thoughts and prayers are with Alfred's family and the community. And, uh, whole territory as Alfred had many friends, especially here, you know, a number of members, 
including myself, have uh, served with him and all the departments, I'm sure, miss him great, greatly. Member statements. Member statements. Returns to oral questions. Returns to oral questions. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Colleagues, before we continue, last week and over the weekend, I had the pleasure of hosting delegates to the 42nd Canadian Parliamentary Seminar here in Yellowknife. We had more than 40 delegates from the House of Commons, eight provinces and two territories. The weather didn't really cooperate with us, but we had excellent business sessions, including their attendance at session last Friday morning. I heard many positive comments about, about our system of government and particularly the thoughtful and respectful way you, way you debated issues in the House. Thanks to each of you for being on your best behavior. <laughs> Let's keep that going. <laughs> Organizing a national conference like this is a lot of work and involves many helping hands. I want to say a special thank you to Danielle Mauger Daniel Lavagana, Katie Weaver, and Katie Weaver of the clerk's office, and to my assistant, Corinne Cruz, who did most of the heavy lifting, and also all the staff that uh, helped out. I also want to thank each of, each of you who attended the sessions, represented topics of interest to our guests, and demonstrated the northern hospitality for which we are so famous. Our delegates, our delegates had an amazing time, learned lots, and hopefully have a new understanding and appreciation of the challenges we face here in the North. Thank you, members. Recognition of visitors in the gallery, member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like, like to recognize my constituent who is here acting as a page, uh, Quaid Sims. Unfortunately, I think he's actually stepped out of the room right now to do a water refill, but I love having the pages here, and one of my favorite activities for uh, being a member has been to be the page for the Youth Parliament. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Great Slave. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Acknowledgements, acknowledgements, oral questions, oral questions, member for Nanakpur. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Last Friday when we were done at about 10 o'clock or uh, 12 o'clock and the uh, minister came down to my office and said the uh, barred services won't be getting into uh, Saks Harbor. And uh, that's one thing we, I dreaded, in, but we've been working together for the last uh, three weeks to, to try to get in there, but due to weather and stuff, but Mr. Speaker, I just want a commitment from my minister today. Is she able to meet with my leadership that I invited down to do, after a, to do a, like a post-mortem and why, why this should not happen again and working together to make a schedule where everybody's on, uh, on, uh, on the schedule that's going to get service that year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nanakput. Mem minister responsible for infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I'm committed to working with the member and the community, and I just also want to take this opportunity. I've apologized to the Mayor Anakina that MPS was unable to make it into Saks Harbor, and would also like to take this first opportunity to apologize to the residents and businesses in Saks Harbor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Nanakput. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for that. The current resupply diesel for home heating, power generation, gasoline and aviation fuels is a major concern for my constituents in Saks Harbor. Can the minister tell the assembly whether is there any need to be have any concern? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Nanakput, minister responsible for infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thankfully, there is sufficient fuel stock in the community to be able to meet the needs for a few months. Um, 
So having sufficient fuel stock on hand does give our staff the, um, the leeway to properly plan and deliver products into the community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Nanakput. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My constituents in Saks Harbor already have the highest living costs in the Northwest Territories. Can the minister inform the assembly and my residents of Saks Harbor whether any extra costs to the charter aircraft to bring barge freight and all goods into uh, and fuel into the community will be passed on to them? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Nanakput, minister responsible for infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to assure the residents of Saks Harbor that no additional costs will be passed on to them, above and beyond what they have already paid for barge service, for any uh, barge goods that will have to be brought in by air. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, there will have to be some hard conversations on dealing with the over oversized freight. We'll have uh, those conversations with our customers and also be looking um, at each case and merit and need. So government departments and agencies are also having these conversations on just what can be uh, delayed or what freight needs to get into Saks Harbor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary member for the Nutbook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All freight's got to get into the community for the residents. The minister can keep and uh, my mayor is informed of uh, the barging situation, how it unfolded a few weeks. Uh, can the minister commit to keeping those lines of communication open with myself, Mayor Anakina, and we deal with the Saks Harbor air resupply to making once it uh, post mortem 2022 shipping season is complete with the regional leadership to discuss and agree a path forward and just a timeline for when are we going to start being able to see goods flow flown into the community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nanakput, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The one thing that the Department and MTS have already have as a takeaway from this 2022 shipping season is the need for better communication with our customers and the general public, especially when circumstances result in changes to sailing schedules. So most of the questions that were forwarded to my office from MLAs Ministers, community, and leadership, um, general public had, um, in fact, had no basis. And, in fact, Mr. Speaker, there were rumors that were started in the absence of regular updates from MTS. One of my priorities is making sure MTS is resourced to provide these updates next sailing season. And yes, Mr. Speaker, I will keep the MLA and the mayor in the loop, consult as necessary, and provide progress reports I will also commit to, in the House, to be able to meet with regional leadership once the post-mortem on the 2022 sailing season, um, so probably in the new year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, everyone in this territory is quite aware of uh, Donny Days, the, the mandatory time that employees get off between Christmas and New Year's, and, and that, you know, was brought to the table a, as a way to kind of counter some, some increases in pay that the union was asking for, is more time off. And uh, I have no doubt that we're, as we enter these next negotiations, given inflation, that the similar conversations about <laughs> fighting over how much of a pay increase is warranted will be happening. So I'm just going to give the, the Minister of Finance a suggestion there that maybe we uh, offer some similar days off in the form of a four-day work week. We could uh, call them Caroline days. Uh, keep it ambiguous uh, which, which of the Carolines uh, can take credit for this. Uh, now, Mr. Speaker, I'm aware that, you know, I, I'm not going to get the minister to spill out her entire bargaining position heading into these negotiations, but I'm just wondering if a reduction in hours or some sort of path towards more four-day work weeks uh, in light of perhaps some record high pay increases uh, is on the table or something she'd be willing to bring forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister Responsible for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think we can have this conversation without even delving into uh, anything to do with bargaining that's upcoming. Um, that, that, I just want to be very clear, that's, I mean, that's a conversation that's had with the union as a partner. But this, the conversation about a four-day work week, uh, I, I have some good news, I think, for the MLA, which is to say there's actually a, quite a lot of flexibility right now for many uh, GNWT employees, that they do have the ability to seek flexible work arrangements, part-time works, job sharing, um, 
And I certainly would take this opportunity to encourage all, all employees, all public servants who may be considering that to actually make the effort and then put the proposal forward to their management. Uh, the remote work policy is an example that we, we took to try to increase the available flexibility. All of course, of course, does depend on meeting the needs of the specific workplace, meeting the operational requirements, but there's actually quite a lot available there. Uh, so before I necessarily go in and uh, revamp the entirety of the, the public service uh, collective agreement, uh, you know, again, there's, there's a lot there that is perhaps being underutilized. And as a post-COVID world, it's an opportunity now to start utilizing the tools we have. If they're not being, if they're not effective, if they're not being, you know, properly uh, uh, employed, then let's, let's sort that out at the management level with uh, supervisors and, their, and public servants so that people can actually use the flexible tools we have. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Yellowknife North. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm glad to hear that I encourage all employees to, you know, if they want to get on flex days, ask their management, and if they want to, you know, have a four-day work week to co contact their uh, local president. Uh, but my, my next question is, you know, I, I think we, what is going on in this territory is every time the GNWT becomes a bit better employer, uh, the private sector struggles and they, they lose workers to that GNWT. And, and I do believe that a four-day work week, uh, that private sector employers, if they adopt it, will be better at retaining and recruiting staff. And uh, I would like our government to kind of push them in that direction. So my question for the Minister of Finance is whether she would be willing to look into any of the incentive programs that other jurisdictions and countries have adopted to encourage private sector employers to do that, whether that be tax incentives or some sort of grant program when companies sign on for a four-day work week. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister Responsible for Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd certainly like to know more about the results that are, may now be starting to come in with respect to four-day work weeks. Uh, I think there was an early idea that this was going to be better for people's mental health, uh, but since then, certainly in, in some of the reading I'm doing, suggests that some people don't like the instability or the, the constant change. I don't have those answers, Mr. Speaker, but I'd like to know what they are. I have not had a groundswell of, of uh, private sector uh, entities asking for me to do this, um, but look, there's always, you know, there's always room for policy change if, in fact, it is something that will bring benefits to residents, to businesses, uh, and ultimately to the labour availability in the north. So, so um, if, if that information comes forward, I'm certainly happy to look at it and see what we can do with it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Inuvik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, just to clarify, uh, my questions are not for the Minister of Housing <laughs> on the Power Corp. It's for the Minister responsible for Northwest Territories Power Corporation. Um, so my first question for the Minister is, has the GNWT um, followed the Auditor General's direction to classify the corporation from a government business enterprise to another government organization, and if not, why? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Inuvik Twin Lakes, Minister Responsible for the Northwest Territories Power Corporation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it was early in the previous government that a decision was made to uh, replace the previous uh, board of NTPC with uh, one consist consisting of deputy ministers. While that change has allowed an opportunity for greater alignment between the NWT Power Corporation with priorities of this GNWT, um, the corporation sole is the sole shareholder, and we also recognize that this type of board government should be reviewed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Nivik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so my question to the minister is what work is being done on this review uh, on, to review NTPC's governance model? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for New Twin Lakes, minister responsible for the Northwest Territories Power Corporation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the review that has been undertaken um, has looked at structures of other utilities and best practices related to any of the board governments through the Power Corporation. Um, you know, if there are changes that are going to be made going forward, I want to make sure that the future government does not end up in a similar place making dramatic changes to a future board. So this is something that we need to thoroughly look through and be able to respond um, to this government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Nuvik Twin Lakes. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you know, I'm, I'm looking at uh, Minister from the Minister Siebert from the past government, and when he stated in the 2016, which is a lot more than just the end of the last government, it is early on in the beginning of their government, um, that he appointed the six deputy ministers, and that was in May of 2016. So I'm just wondering, how much longer does the NTPC need to figure out whether they're a crown corporation or not, or what their board's going to be made up, if it's a representative, if it's people who are you know, specialized in doing this type of work, or is it going to continue as deputy ministers? And if not, why don't we just uh, make it a department and so that way we can hold them accountable in this house? So I am kind of my question related to this is all in one maybe, but how are we going to bring that into this house so that we can hold the Power Corp accountable by this Legislative Assembly so we can ask those questions like we do on every other department in detail. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Nevik Tin Lakes, Minister Responsible for Northwest Territories Power Corporation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It must, I, it must be remembered that the Northwest Territories Power Corporation operates as a regulated utility under the Public Utilities Act. So this, this is meant to ensure that monopoly positions uh, as provided and distributor of electricity does not result in unfair uh, rates for customers. We have to recognize that as, as a regulated utility, Northwest Territories Power Corporation is different than other corporations. It cannot easily be converted into something that looks more like a department. Mr. Speaker, it doesn't mean that the gov uh, governance changes that do not require legislative amendment cannot be put in place. Mr. Speaker, a board made up of members with the appropriate backgrounds and potentially with a balanced orientation that can replace deputy ministers. Having deputy ministers on the board helps ensure that knowledge shareholders, shareholder priorities, including alignment with our energy strategies, is ensured. An option that might be uh, that we might see continued participation of GWT officials as board members or observers or whatever the governance structure is also possibly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Nevik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I think that just kind of gave me a bunch of ideas to, uh, for a new member statement tomorrow. Lots of more questions on this, how we can uh, incorporate the Power Corp with all our energy plans and what it's costing us. But all I want to know is when do we expect to see these changes on this governance model and what is the timeline? Like my colleague says, like we want a date. We, we've been waiting. I've, I've been asking since 2020 when we first got in February of 2020. So I just want a date as to when we're going to have a governance model. And if, if you're not doing it, let us know that you haven't done any work on it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank, thank you, Member for Nevik Twin Lakes, Minister Responsible for Northwest Territories Power Corporation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are doing the work. I mean, th this is not something that just happens overnight. This is a lot of thought process going into it. And like I said earlier, some of the work that we're doing, we need to do, make sure we're doing it right. Um, also, I want uh, the members to know that we will share the information um, in the near future so, so that before any final decision is made on Power Corporation Board Governance is... Um, we get the benefit of hearing from members. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. My question is for the Minister of Finance, who has responsibility for telecommunication services. My, sta my <laughs> statement outlined uh, reports that the ANIC F2 satellite is going to fail uh, probably by February 2023, and we may have disruptions in service to eight NWT communities. So can the minister give us the current status of the satellite's fate and uh, maintenance of service and how this government is working to prevent a service outage? I'll see Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Frame Lake. Minister responsible for finance. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this, uh, the satellite uh, is uh, one of the service assets of the Northwest Tel, uh, who did put us uh, on notice as early as I think they were able to with respect to what's happening with Anik F2. Uh, there is a fair bit of work happening on this. I am looking to an opportunity. I had been looking for an opportunity to, to get this information out, so I'm, I'm grateful for that here. Uh, I can say that the information I've received to date from Northwest Tel, they've got a couple of options uh, that they're working on. Uh, in order to ensure that there are, uh, firstly, new additional satellites that they are purchasing services from, so those to cover the affected area, and also, as uh, the member has noted, there are indeed eight satellite communities, and ensuring that they have the necessary levels of hardware to make use of the new systems and to also potentially make use of uh, new low-Earth orbit uh, companies that are coming online to provide their services. So, a few different things in play, uh, but all, all of which is to say that we are being assured that there will not be an interruption in service. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Framley. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the Minister for that, but you know, having lived here for a number of years, I'm used to service disruptions when it comes to electricity. So, uh, but uh, you know, one of the things that I guess I've heard is that this, there's a company, One Web's Low Earth uh, Orbit satellites that might be helpful. Is the minister aware of this? And if service improvements are possible, is the GNWT taking this opportunity to urge that any, any improvements be made permanent? Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister Responsible for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that is exactly the uh, entity when I had mentioned that there's other low Earth orbit uh, companies that are being engaged. That is precisely the company I had in mind. So, yes, I'm, I'm aware of them, uh, and, and Northwest Tel is aware of them, and they are, I, I understand, working with them uh, on this project and to see that they are uh, you know, brought into the fabric of telecommunication services here in the Northwest Territories. I can't say to what extent they are discussing a permanent relationship with Northwest Tel, but it is my understanding generally that they are looking, uh, as I said, to be more involved in the Northwest Territories telecommunications industry generally. Um, and last comment, Mr. Speaker, again, as I've said in this House before, CRTC has uh, mandated that uh, 5010 be available in all communities in the Northwest Territories. So th th those service standards are mandated and they are, they are uh, coming and on the way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Frame Lake. No, see, Monsieur le Président, I want to thank the Minister for that. Uh, look, either you have a satellite service or you don't, <laughs> and uh, there's not much in between. So has the Minister asked Northwest Tel Telesat for a firm assurance that alternate systems will kick in when ANIC F2 goes down, and how does the Minister intend to keep the public updated? Because I don't think the companies are doing a very good job. I'll see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister responsible for finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I've, I've certainly been assured with, uh, you know, for the same, I think, the same concern uh, that the member is raising, that it's every resident, every business, government services, uh, there are many in those satellite communities that are depending on this system working and the system not having service interruptions. So uh, it is my understanding that the mitigation solutions that I just described, having other satellites in place, for, as, I, as I indicated, that this is to be in place by the end of this calendar year which does give a bit of leeway if, in fact, there may be some delays, but, of course, hoping that there are not. Um, as for keeping the public updated, Mr. Speaker, there's certainly, I can certainly ask you know, whether we can be putting out uh, some sort of updates. It's, you know, I get an update and then I give an update. That's not necessarily the most ideal way of getting information out into the public sphere, um, but certainly if that is uh, of benefit, then I will certainly look into what ways we can do uh, to, again, pass on information as we are receiving it and encourage those who are the actual providers of that information to be doing a better job of getting it out. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Final supplementary member for Framley. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, you know, we should be seeing a service expanding and improving, not threatened by crashing satellites. So does this government have any sort of a plan or strategy for NWT residents to get the same telecoms services as enjoyed by the average Canadian? Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Frame Lake, Minister responsible for finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, 
I think there's a, there's not an average Canadian, unfortunately, when it comes to telecom services. And one thing I've learned is that many rural, remote, and particularly northern communities struggle uh, with their telecoms. The the upside of that is that that does lends a stronger voice at federal, provincial, territorial tables for all of us that are struggling with this issue. Um, and it's one of the few times where you know I would say the fact that CRTC has as much involvement as they do on our telecoms industry. Uh, does give a, a place where we can take that voice and take those concerns. So, uh, as I'd indicated already earlier, there's already a mandate that uh, 5010 service levels are to be provided to uh, all communities within the Northwest Territories over the next couple of years. Uh, we do get regular updates from Northwest Tel with respect to hitting that target. And then, as with generally, you know, I do think there's the next challenge of affordability and, of, uh, and accessibility that. Uh, that we do need to face. And in that regard, yes, the Government of the Northwest Territories uh, continues to advocate very directly, I would say, on those issues, looking for very specific solutions and providing that advocacy to CRTC, who are, again, the regulator over the telecoms industry here in the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Fitcho. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last Thursday in the House, I questioned the Minister, the Education Minister, on whether grade level statistics are being collected and reported. The Minister listed documents and reports that may contain this information. Can the Minister point me to where I can find the actual grade levels of the students in the NWT and whether this information is available for parents, education leaders, and the public to see today? Masi. Thank you, Member for Decho, Minister Responsible for Education, Culture and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, a child's grade level, uh, so, you know, how they might be performing in class, and I don't like to use that term for something like junior kindergarten, I don't know if they have a grade level at, at junior kindergarten, uh, but that type of information is absolutely accessible to parents. I encourage par parents to have conversations with teachers. Um, to, to, to make, so they're informed, so they can make the best decisions um, for the future of their child. Uh, there is information on how children are doing that is in the possession of the education bodies, and there is uh, broad general information that's available to the public in terms of how children across the Northwest Territories are doing academically. In this house, um, earlier this year, I tabled a document entitled JK-12 to Education System Performance Measures Technical Report from 2019-2020, and that contains information, uh, a variety of information about students of all ages um, throughout the JK-12 system. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Decho. I see, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> I see we still have problems with uh, collecting data, uh, especially the grade levels, which is uh, very critical at this juncture in our uh, <clears throat> in our education um, modernization. Um, the minister identified that the data is effectively owned by the edu education bodies and, the, and now the uh, teachers and the parents. Uh, the minister alluded at that time that the information is not at our fingertips. Can the minister explain what is the delay in the education bodies sharing this information with the department? Merci. Thank you, Member for Decho, Minister Responsible for EC and E. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. So, if, if you look at the Education Act, in that act, it, it lays out how information can be shared. The minister doesn't have the same type of access to that information that the education bodies have. So, there is a way to for us to access that information, but it is not a simple, straightforward. Uh, process. Each year education bodies table uh, the, their, their accountability framework reports which contains a, a significant amount of information and so the department does have access to that uh, but there is no common shared system that the ECE can reach into to look at where a child might be at a given point or even um, in a certain region so the department has to reach out have a discussion with the superintendent perhaps that uh, it goes to the board perhaps the, the DEA has a conversation uh, what I would, what I can do is follow up with the member and provide additional information, though, on, on some of the processes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, oral questions, member for Dechu. 
I see, Mr. Speaker. Now, there is a big problem with uh, sharing that information. You know, at the grade levels, we need to really get a handle on those because it's really hurting in the small communities where uh, we're having graduates that are, are not achieving the grade 12 grade level. And I'm after, you know, that information um, about what actual grade levels they're, they're attaining in the small communities and maybe in some of the larger centers. It's very critical <clears throat> for the future of the education in NWT. We need to know that, so we, know, we need to know what we have to fix moving forward. And I'm wondering why the minister is having a hard time getting that information. Because you're going to build a university and we don't have students that are attaining the grade 12 level to attend them. You know, that's going to be a problem. I just wondered if the minister's got uh, any comments on that. Merci. Thank you, Member for Detro, Minister responsible for ECNA. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'll say that there is information out there. If the member would like to know how many students in small communities scored at acceptable, below acceptable, or uh, excellent levels on their English language arts 30-2 diploma exams, we have that information. It's publicly available. So there is a level of detail that people can dig down into. I can't tell, and I don't have that information, but I can't tell you what a particular student in a particular community, I can't tell you what their grades are, but we have, there's a lot of information that it, that it is publicly available. And I will say there are lots of students who could go to a, a university. A lot of students do go to university. I went to university. My dad went to university. A number of members in this, in this uh, building grew up in the Northwest Territories. We all went to university. So I, I don't think we need to put down students and say that they're not achieving. A lot of students are achieving. There are students at med school. There are students who were in law school. There's engineers. There's all sorts of students. There's all sorts of success stories in the Northwest Territories. I, I fully agree that there are students who we can do better to assist. But I don't want to, to paint um, a picture of all students in the territory as underachievers. We have a number of very successful uh, future leaders right now in the JK-12 system and uh, off at university. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, member for Dechu. Merci, Mr. Speaker. I don't agree with the uh, minister. We still need the statistics for many of our education bodies, even at the, the local levels, and even at this level too, so I can do my job properly. I don't have any stats. He doesn't have any stats himself. You know, of all the, all the grade levels that we have in our, in our schools, he hasn't uh, come to visit Fort Providence or looked at the stats in the Fort Providence school over the last several, several years. And I came into this house in 2019, and I told that story to everybody. That many of our students are heading to the colleges and universities that he's talking about in the South. And they're all returning within a month or so, with sad faces and crying, because they don't have the education level to continue in that post-secondary education. I've stated that many times. They all applaud that everything is good on that side. Where's the stats? Give us some statistics. I'll see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Detro, Minister responsible for ECNA. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So here I have a document. You can see there are stats all in it, and I know I'm not allowed to use props, so I apologize for that, but I want to show people this document does exist. It, is, it exists in the real world. There are numbers in it. Those numbers are correlated with outcomes in, in, edu in schools. So there are stats. There are stats. I promise you, Mr. Speaker, if someone wants to go online and, and click a couple links, you will find stats. They're not hidden. They're easily accessible. Uh, we understand that we can do a better job with stats, though. The Auditor General pointed that out. So we are taking steps to uh, make information more accessible. So that we can provide more information to make better decisions. That work is underway. I don't want to say that we don't recognize this as an issue. We do. But it is incorrect to say that there are no stats available. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Haverson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 
the issue of dredging has to be settled before next spring. And, uh, you know, I'm hopeful and I expect the uh, Minister of Infrastructure to uh, have a plan and also have uh, funds available to do something. It's just gone on too long. It's been probably 25 years, but, you know, uh, we see a little dredging with the MTS and, and that's about it. So, Mr. Speaker, I am certain the Minister was made aware of yet another marine vessel grounded on the sandbar at the mouth of the Hay River on the weekend. I would, and I would ask the Minister to make a commitment to visit uh, Hay River and hold a public meeting with uh, not the community members and also the stakeholders that, uh, that we, you know, that who depend on a safe and navigable harbour. Thank you. Thank you, Member, for Hay River South, Minister responsible for infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yes, I am aware of the weekend's incident. Um, we will be in discussions with uh, Coast Guard regarding some of the assistance that MTS provided. I know the members asking me to come to the community. I think, you know, that's, that's a discussion will have to be made as we look at a business case and um, in this situation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd ask the Minister to confirm if a comprehensive business case was ever completed for dredging the channel and harbour at Hay River. Uh, ministers uh, before her have talked about it and I've never seen a business case. I haven't uh, you know, been able to, uh, to read anything put in front of me. So I would like to know, I guess, whether there was actually a business case done for dredging. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Minister responsible for infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what we need to do is a full scope and operational plan for addressing the issue now and in the future for the costing, um, costing the same. Survey work was completed in 2016, which identified a number of things, including 100,000 cubic meters of mud and silt that was in excess of established grade requirements. Mr. Speaker, following the, the recent flood here in the territories, it was recommended that we take a two-phased approach to this. So first, we need to do a study to be able to assess the amount of silt and mud that has to be removed to restore established grade requirements. And phase two, Mr. Speaker, would be in, involve um, a program established to be able to undertake this work. So the department will prepare a proposal for federal government once we have a better understanding on the scope of this project. So I'm continuing to have conversations with my federal counterparts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what I'm hearing on the other side is the same thing, is that we're complicating something that's not complicated. We have, a, we have a, an area that's, that's not that large that has to be dredged. We know the water is, you know, we know the water is in around that four or five foot mark, which is about, uh, you know, a draft of a, a vessel is probably five feet, and uh, and they're getting stuck, and and it and it continues. We talk about climate change, but we do nothing about it. We just sit back. So, you know, we have to do our homework. So let's not let's not complicate this because what I see here is the government now going to take, you know, another year, two years. So, I would ask the minister if she would be willing to come to commit to updating the business case that maybe was already done and if not develop a new business case and once completed provide it to the standing committee prior to uh, submission and done before the end of November. Thank you. Thank you member for Haver South, Minister responsible for infrastructure. Thank you Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. I will, yes I will commit to be able to share um, the proposal with standing committee prior to submission to be able to get some feedback and perhaps um, you know we've got a wealth of knowledge from the MLA um, Simpson so I think that would be um, very appropriate to be able to share that information. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Thank you Minister. Final supplementary member for Haver South. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, my understanding is that you know the uh, the minister travels back and forth to Ottawa once in a while, and I'm hoping that she has a meeting, you know, before the end of this year, where she could take a business case that that would be ready for submission to the federal government. 
because like I said, you know, we're not talking, we're not talking, uh, you know, something that's, that's uh, that complicated. So would the minister commit to having the business case ready for submission to the federal government uh, before the end of this year? Thank you. Thank you. Member for Haver South, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there are a number of things that has to um, happen uh, before we submit the proposal. For example, we have to do um, bathymetric surveys to be able to fully understand the scope of this work that needs to be completed. Most of this work happens in the summer, Mr. Speaker, so it would likely be next fall, but I mean, I would be happy to have further discussions with the, with the member in terms of, you know, a path going forward and to be able to... Um, to working with the community as well, um, because I mean this affects a lot of the um, the activities that happen up and down the valley. To be able to get our our barges and our tugs out to to get into um, fuel in the communities, for example. So you know this is something that we can work with the member in the community to be able to understand the uh, perhaps timelines or some of the scope of work that's required. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Tuna Day Well Day. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in June uh, June 23rd, 2022, CBC article concerning the matter raised in my member's statement. A spokesperson is quoted stating that housing NWT is reviewing its policies and programs. Can the minister provide the outcome of that review to the House? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Tuna Day Well Day, Minister Responsible for Housing and WT. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for your question. I very much appreciate the um, providing updates on the portfolio. I'm proud to say that we've been working very closely and diligently with the Indigenous governments and with the federal government as well, too. And looking at the 100, um, 100 uh, unit delivery that we do have, over 500 million coming to the Northwest Territories directly to the federal government. And looking at our policies, I am committed to have those policies ready and available of uh, April 1st, 2023. And I'm hoping to have um, a few of those policies ready um, for um, review um, to, the, to the Standing Committee as well too. I just got a, um, just got a message that the Standing Committee did, um, did accept to our technical briefing to uh, look at those policies that we have now completed. They have been reviewed by the Council of Leaders. I'm very excited. It also has been um, reviewed by stakeholders throughout the Northwest Territories and by our staff. A lot of input. We've got uh, 12 um, reports that have been done. A lot of collaboration has been done to complete these policies. And it's about time we start changing the way we do business. Masi. Good minute. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Tunde Wilde. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer. Um, what step has Housing and WT taken to ensure that my constituents and other like her don't fall through the cracks? And can and, <clears throat> and can we lobby access housing and WT programs and services? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member for Tunde Wilde, Minister Responsible for Housing and WT. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the, the questions coming forward as well, too. We are in the middle of reviewing our LHOs and our local boards and authorities at the community and the ground level. We're reviewing our programs and policies as well, too, and also the delivery of our programs throughout the Northwest Territories. I do understand that we have issues with the threshold, with the rent um, increase and, um, and, the, and the operation and maintenance of these units, and uh, we also did speak about um, more money coming uh, to housing, to the portfolio. Um, we have been working very closely with the federal government as well too to access the uh, co-investment funding. Um, the other thing I really want to speak about as well too is I'm thankful to this government for providing five million over three years for um, for housing NWT to support those federal uh, applications coming forward and fulfilling the 25% obligation. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Tunde Wilde. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the minister commit to personally reviewing the case file of my constituent of Mildred Lockhart as soon as possible? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Tunde Wilde, minister responsible for housing and WT. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know we're not supposed to be, be speaking about specific files, but I've already directed my uh, department to provide me with an update. I will follow up with the member. Must see it, Mr. Speaker. Sir Oral, final supplementary, member for Tunde Wilde. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. Can the minister confirm if the local housing authority have any spare sewage tanks that's not being used? And um, if there's a way we could use that for Ms. Lockhart's uh, situation and have this tank replaced next year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member, for Tunade Welde, minister responsible for housing and WT. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a minister, I'm committed to be working with the residents of the Northwest Territories, and I do understand the lack of material and the delivery for each of these, each of these communities. It's, it's quite unique. Um, I will um, ask the department and, uh, to see what t if we do have sewage tanks that possibly are available, and um, also I'll reach out to the Indigenous governments as well too to see if there's interest to be working with them in looking at a community initiative project. Oh, sorry. And... Um, being able to uh, to provide that programming um, within the community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Mumphy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Housing explain the eviction process? Is there a dollar value in arrears that triggers an eviction? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Mumfoy, Minister Responsible for Housing and WT. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member. It's quite an important question to be asking uh, because we are under our policy review right now and we're looking at a submission and a technical briefing to Standing Committee as well. Um, the process for the evictions are very lengthy. We do have to work with the Residential um, Tenancy Act as well too for the Northwest Territories. The local housing authority, the board of directors, they do have the authority to be working with these clients. Uh, we do practice the last chance agreement, providing advice and counseling to the, to the tenants as well, and also repayment loans. Um, what I've um, gathered for the department as well is that um, preferably when we are exercising um, evictions that it's a, through the last chance agreement and it's the last chance resort that we actually do have and we try our best to counsel the tenants to try to keep them in our units um, but unfortunately we do get to, um, to a point where we have to really think about the health and safety of our tenants as well. Must see it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Mumphrey. Can the minister explain <clears throat> how many notices are provided to tenants before an eviction occurs and what, re what reduced payment plan options are available to tenants? Thank you. Thank you, member for Mumphrey, minister responsible for housing and WT. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through the policy review, I've asked the department to create a step-by-step -step, um, for the eviction process. What I've noticed in the smaller communities is that um, they delay the eviction process as well. It's not as easy as a one, two, three, and, um, and the, and the uh, file is, is transferred over to the, uh, to the rental officer. Um, the LHOs do try to work very closely with the tenants. The last thing we would like um, is to have anybody evicted uh, throughout the Northwest Territories. My preference as a minister is I would like to see um, home ownership become an opportunity, but unfortunately not all tenants um, qualify for home ownership um, throughout the territory, but the LHO uh, and the housing NWT does work very closely with each of these clients and counsel them before the eviction uh, process um, is initiated. What what I've seen since I've um, had the portfolio is uh, one of the longest uh, e um, eviction processes was over seven years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Mumphui. <laughs> um, okay. Um, can the Minister of Housing explain whether families with children are approached differently, differently than families without children when being evicted? What extra supports are in place for specifically low-income families with children. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Mumphui, Minister Responsible for Housing and WT. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member. She's quite passionate about the portfolio for her riding as well, too, and I very much sympathize with her because I hear a lot of these... Um, a lot of these questions being asked throughout the Northwest Territories and, and housing tries to do its best to work with families and trying to keep them housed. Um, looking at the criteria that we do have, we do work with um, we do work with uh, um, ECE, we do work with the Department of Health as well too to try to find programs and services to try to prevent the eviction, but also to try to support the families as well too. One of the um, programs that we do have throughout the territory, and it's really up to the local uh, community governments, is we do have a housing support worker pilot project that was initiated also in, in Beshako, and it, it was very successful. It was a pilot project that kind of mirrored um, the urgency to have that located in each of the communities as well too. Um, just with that program itself, um, it was an advocacy position that would work with the tenant and with housing NWT, with the rental officer with health and social services with ECE with justice and it was kind of like a wraparound service that we were trying to pilot in a smaller community and Beshako was our preference to have that um, to have that program and it was very successful currently um, we are working with the Clicho housing working group to re-establish that position we do have funding available for the position but um, it's right now on the table and in the, in the talks between the Clicho government and housing and WT must seat, Mr. Speaker Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, Member for Mumfui. I would like to get some more information on that as well. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, low-income families at risk of evictions in public house require a range of supports to climb, climb out of their circumstances. It is not a, just a financial issue. There are many reasons why parents might find themselves at risk of evictions. Can the minister identify whether the GNWT, the government of the Northwest Territories, Chouraj, any extra supports when low-income families are at, are at risk of ev evictions? Thank you, Member for Mumfui, Minister Responsible for Housing NWT. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just wanted to just reiterate the Housing Support Worker Pilot Project and the importance of that program because we do have those supports in the larger centers and we don't necessarily have them in the smaller communities as well. And working with the local housing authorities, we're trying to change our approach and more looking at our approach as a social programming and providing those adequate supports in the smaller communities and um, engaging and working more closely with, um, with the appropriate departments that are located in the smaller community as well. I just wanted to point out that the social workers, the addiction counselors that are there because we do have a number of issues um, surfacing at the smaller community level and not only one department can provide those supports for the one individual. Um, so I really um, work and want to work very closely with my colleagues as well too in trying to establish and find a more clear path into keeping people in their units. I don't want to see any evictions throughout the territory but we are trying to work with the tenant. Must see it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Framley. Merci, Monsieur le Président. My questions are for the Minister of ITI. Last week confirmed there had been 32 secret meetings held with the mining industry on the development of the new mining regulations. To be clear, Mr. Speaker, I support the Department meeting with the mining industry, but that information should be available to everybody else. So can the Minister commit to tabling before the end of this sitting a list of the dates and mining companies or organizations that attended these secret meetings and the topics discussed? Masi, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister Responsible for Industry, Tourism and Investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I can't provide a list of who's attended secret meetings because there have not been secret meetings. I am happy to provide a list of the entities that have attended a variety of the engagement sessions that have been held to date uh, by the department with relevant uh, stakeholders, including the Chamber of Mines, as various uh, uh, specific en entities as well, uh, including Alternative North. Um, so happy to provide that list, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we'll do that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Framley. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the Minister for that commitment. 
So uh, last week, though, she said in the House, quote, before I go out and make any promises to publish anything that I'm working with them, I want to go back and make sure that they will not be taken by surprise and that the IGCS, of which the GNWT is only one member, are on board with what we are publishing, end of quote. So can the Minister tell us whether the Intergovernmental Council Secretariat was informed of these secret meetings with the mining industry and had an opportunity to review those presentations beforehand? Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister responsible for ITI. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yes, uh, the Intergovernmental Council, of which the GWT is but one one part or one member, uh, they are working together in a technical group. That technical group uh, reviewed the discussion papers, and then it's from that technical group that the, the uh, presentations are prepared, and then those presentations are shared with various parties, uh, depending on what their level of interest or engagement might be. And those, to date, uh, for instance, have included the Chamber of Mines, um, and uh, you know, or in another case, uh, the Alternatives North, and the, the presentations were tailored to the entity that was being presented to. Um, and that indeed is uh, what was that did go through the, the technical work groups. Um, I am happy to confirm that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Framley. See, Monsieur le Président, I want to thank the Minister for that and find it rather curious. Information has already been shared outside of government and should be made public now in the interest of transparency and fairness. So can the Minister tell us why she finds it necessary now to ask the mining industry and the Intergovernmental Council Secretary whether it is okay to make this information public? Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister responsible for ITI. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, let me clarify. So, again, it's the IGCS, uh, of which the GNBT is one member, uh, that has a technical working group, and it's that technical working group that is approving um, how to distill down the complex policy papers that we have been put together and to turn that into a presentation that can then be taken out uh, to stakeholders, including industry. Um, it's not the other way around. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, I will, though, note uh, there are, right now, there is a public engagement site that is open. Uh, certainly encourage anyone that's interested to go to that website. There are two separate directions that one can go when one goes to the website. One that is a general email, so for anyone that does want more information or tech, including especially the technical information, um, and another one that is, it directs uh, industry to technical, the technical site. Um, but certainly if uh, anyone were to come forward and say, look, I'm, I'm an expert in something, I want to get into the weeds of something, um, they can have, you know, a presentation can certainly be arranged. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, there's a concern uh, that is expressed that, you know, taking something that is very complex, uh, I mean, I've, I've had the opportunity to look at uh, the, the technical presentations, they are complex, they are down in the, into the weeds of what is a heavy regulatory uh, area, uh, and to put that out without some plain language, without some, you know, something that's a little more simplified for a non-expert, without, for instance, for me, having the opportunity to sit and ask the experts as I go through it, um, that does not necessarily benefit, that does not make for better engagement, that does not make for more clarity, uh, so they, there is right now work happening to get something made more plain language and as soon as that is available I'm told in the next couple of months we will have that out uh, for those who might benefit from that kind of an engagement material. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Thank you Minister. Oral questions member for Framelick. Merci Monsieur le Président. Um, I want to thank the Minister for that. Just post the presentations so everybody has the information but Regulatory capture occurs when a political entity, policymaker, or regulator is co-opted to serve the commercial, ideological, or political interests of a constituency, such as a particular geographic area, industry, profession, or ideological group. Department of Industry, uh, Tourism, and Investment is responsible for both promoting and regulating mining. Meetings outside the Intergovernmental Council are being held with only the party being regulated at the table to develop these mining regulations. So can the Minister tell us how she intends to avoid the appearance of regulatory capture in developing the mining regulations? Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister responsible for industry, tourism and investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Government of the Northwest Territories doesn't operate in silos. Uh, there are right now uh, working groups between departments, so it's not simply this is not an ITI alone endeavor, endeavor or exercise. 
Uh, and importantly, Mr. Speaker, this is one of the first, and indeed I think it may well be one of the, be the first opportunity where we are using the legislative protocol with the IGCS. So IGCS involves um, GNBT being one member uh, and, in, and the Indigenous governments uh, who are part of the devolution agreement being the other members. So this is something that is being led through that framework um, and again to which the entirety of the government of the Northwest Territories contributes. Uh, and then it goes out to uh, en entities, Chamber of Mines, Alternatives North, um, specific organizations, specific uh, uh, industry members who would be the ones to utilize uh, those regulations, who might be the ones to apply the regulations. Um, you know, the Mars system for online maps taking involves Department of Finance, involves technical experts over uh, who understand how the website systems work. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm not, I'm not concerned that we're going to wind up in the situation that the MLA is raising. I appreciate uh, the concern. I mean, that's, that's the point of the questions in the House. Um, but there's a lot of systems built in here where it's not, it's a very different type of process from one where one department and one government goes off and does a regulation. Uh, quite the contrary, Mr. Speaker. We have uh, a department that's working uh, as one unit in a much bigger system with the IGCS. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm able with that to say that I'm confident we won't wind up in that situation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for here or South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I can't let go of dredging. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Infrastructure confirm what technical capacity in the area of dredging does she have in her department? Thank you. Thank you, Member for here or South, Minister responsible for infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, when, when the member came forward and approached me in talking about dredging in Hay River, you know, we had discussions. We met um, with some of my infrastructure staff to be able to look at what work is required going forward in, um, in doing the planning and doing the business case and, you know, going out to the communities and talking to... to um, people that are affected. It's, there's not just infrastructure and MTS that's affected, Mr. Speaker. There's Coast Guard, there's the local um, shipping, um, the fishing vessels. So there are a number of things that um, play into factor, but we do have staff. I did commit earlier into looking at, um, looking at this work serious. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Shoot. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Haver South. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, what we're talking about is a section of channel that's probably maybe three to five hundred feet long and, and however wide it may be, uh, you know, you're probably going to need 150 to three, or 200 feet uh, to get barges and vessels through there safely. That's what we're talking about uh, initial, initial work. And, you know, we can look, uh, the problem I have is that the department's looking at the whole thing and not, not breaking it up and seeing what can be done uh, earlier. Uh, so I'd, I guess I'd ask the, uh, if the minister would be willing to, to take a look at if, if, uh, you know, if we could look at what could be done this year or this spring uh, or even this winter uh, for dredging. Like we could be dredging uh, off, the, off the ice that's uh, uh, say in January or February uh, and with hose in that, that. We've done it on the Liard River, we've done it on the Mackenzie River before. So is the minister willing to look at that option as well? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, there are a number of things that needs to take place. Um, you know, we want to make sure we do this right. We come up with a good business case to be able to bring towards our federal counterparts and, um, and, and start looking at public engagement, start looking at getting a number of people on board so that we can um, start to do this work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, previously the Minister had mentioned that bathymetric surveys had to be done during the summer. Well, that's not quite true. They can be done in the winter as well. So, I, you know, it, it, when I hear that it has to be done in the summer, and that's why I asked about the uh, technical support that she has in her department. Uh, you know, if I know that, and I've got no real technical background, then I'm, I'm hoping that her, her people would have it. So is she willing to look at winter work uh, to, to determine uh, 
the extent of dredging required. I'd like to see your, the, see your department collect the information as quickly as possible uh, so that we can get that business case done and into the federal government. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is, you know, I hear the member's concern. I, it's something that I just can't commit until I know what work is involved. And, you know, I'd have further discussions with the member. In terms of uh, capacity, um, uh, whether we can get the equipment would be another thing. And, you know, if we do go ahead, we need to make sure that we do this right so that we, um, we don't have this issue again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary member for Haver South. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you know, the, right now, the sediment buildup in the channel is critical. And if we go through, we come next spring, we're going to probably be in the same, we're going to be in the, you know, in the same, we're having the same issues that we have today. So, you know, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to do is push the department so that they actually act as quickly as possible. You know, this has been going on for, you know, 25 years. We haven't done anything. We talked about it. We talk about it. And that's all we ever do. Like, it's not rocket science. We've got some silt build up. That's it. Let's just get rid of it. So, will the minister commit her department to consider all options to have collection of information required to develop the, uh, business case, the business case before the end of this year? Thank you. Thank you. Member for Haver South, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you know, there are a number of things that need to take place, such as um, getting licensed before the winter, um, doing some of the environmental work that's required to be able to do this. However, I do want to um, mention that we will um, direct staff to be able to lay out a plan, identify a pathway forward to be able to have further discussions with a member in terms of how and when we can get this work done. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Colleagues, our time for oral questions has expired. R written questions. Written questions. Returns for written questions. Returns for written questions. Replies to the Commissioner's address. Replies to the Commissioner's address. Petitions. Petitions. Reports of committees on the review of bills. Reports of committees on the review of bills. Reports of standing and special committees. Reports of standing and special committees. Tabling of documents. Tabling of documents. Member for Framley. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I wish to table the following document. A letter from myself to the Minister of Northern Affairs dated July 15th, 2022 regarding Tlicho government request for a regional study under part 5.2 of the Mackenzie Valley Resource Management Act. Must see Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Tabling of documents. Tabling of documents. Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wish to table an email from the Minister of Infrastructure dated October 6, 2022 regarding the negotiated contract for construction of phase one of the Prohibition Creek access road. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Great Slave. Tabling of documents. Tabling of documents. Notices of motion. Notices of motion. Motions. Motions. Member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to make the following two motions. Whereas table document 528-19-2, or bracket two, sorry, uh, 2021 review of members' compensation benefits, Northwest Territories was tabled in this house. Now, therefore, I move, seconded by the Honourable Member for Hay River North, that table document 528-19, bracket two, 2021 review of members' compensation benefits, Northwest Territories, be referred to Committee of the Whole for consideration. Here South, motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is carried. Uh, this item will be moved into Committee of the Whole. Motions, motions, member for Haver South. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, whereas Table Document 654-19, Bracket 2, 2021-2022, Northwest Territories Elect Electoral Boundaries Commission Final Report was tabled in this House. Now, therefore, I move, seconded by the Honourable Member for Hay River North, that Table Document 654-19, Bracket 2, 2021-2022, Northwest, Ter Northwest Territories Electrical Electric Electoral Boundaries <laughs> Commission final report be referred to Committee of the Whole for consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Haver South. Motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Any abstentions? The motion is carried. This item, this item will be moved into Committee of the Whole. Motions. Motions. Notice is a motion for the first reading of bills. Notice is a motion for the first reading of bills. Minister responsible for housing and WT. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I give notice that on Wednesday, October 19, 2022, I will present Bill 56, an act to amend the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation Act, to be read for the first time. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Notice is a motion for the first reading of bills. Minister responsible for justice. Mr. Speaker, I give notice that on Wednesday, October 19, 2022, I will present Bill 57, Miscellaneous Statute Law Amendment Act 2022, to be read for the first time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Notice is a motion for the first reading of bills. Notice is a motion for the first reading of bills. First reading of bills, first reading of bills, second reading of bills, second reading of bills. Consideration and Committee of the Whole of Bills and Other Matters, Bill 23, 29, 48, 52, and 53. Committee Report 32 19, brackets 2, with member for Nevictoon Lake Signature. I now call Committee of the Whole to order. What is the wish of committee? Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, committee wishes to consider um, Committee Report 32-19 brackets 2, report on the review of the Chief Electoral Officer's auxiliary report, issues arising from the 2019 territorial election. I see, Madam President. Does committee agree? Thank you, committee. We'll take a short recess and resume the item.
call committee of the whole back to order committee we've agreed to consider committee report 32-192 reports on the chief electoral officers auxiliary report issues arising from the 2019 territorial election i will go to the deputy chair of the standing committee on rules and procedures for any opening comments member for hay river south Thank you, Madam Chair. The Election and Plebiscite Act requires the Chief Electoral Officer, CEO, to present a report on the administration of the election within six months of the election. The Speaker tabled the, the Chief Electoral Officer report on the administration of the 2019 Territorial General Election on May 28, 2020. It was referred to this committee for review. <laughs> The committee completed its review and presented committee report 19 or 9-19 bracket 2 to the assembly on February 23rd, 2021. In that report, the committee made 19 recommendations. All the recommendations were adopted by the assembly on March 30th, 2021. Three of those recommendations directed the CEO to conduct additional research and to report back to the legislative assembly within six months. On March 29th, 2022, the Speaker tabled the auxiliary report of the Chief Electoral Officer, issues arising from the 2019 general election. This report responded to the additional research requested requests and included one further recommendation following the Tuna Day Welliday by-election. The CEO raised additional issues in a letter to the Speaker dated July 25, 2022, which the committee considered and has made the eight recommendations contained in this report. If the, if the recommendations are adopted by the House today, they will be considered by the Board of Management who will use them to draft amendments to the Elections and Plebiscites Act. Any changes to legislation will be brought back to the Assembly for consideration, hopefully later this sitting. The Committee thanks the CEO for meeting with Committee to discuss these additional issues. Other members may wish to speak further to the report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'll now open the floor to general comments on the committee report 32-192. Do any members have general comments? Seeing none. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I move that this committee recommends that elections NWT trial a vote anywhere model during advanced voting in the offices of the returning officers. And further, that any necessary legislative amendments that are required to allow such a model be made. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Member for Frame Lake. Yeah, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, I guess uh, I, I do want to thank the Chief Electoral Officer for returning to the uh, Rules and Procedures Committee with uh, some research that had been requested on, on a few matters. Uh, so I want to thank publicly thank the, the CEO for his diligence in doing that work and this is really about trying to increase and improve uh, voting opportunities uh, for all residents of the NWT so that they could vote anywhere in, in the Northwest Territories at any of the, 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 the returning officer offices and uh, you know I did this federally I was in Winnipeg visiting uh, one of our kids and got to go and vote there for a federal election in the Northwest Territories. And uh, this will enable more people to vote and trialing this, I think is, is a great idea. So I support it. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Extensions. Motion is carried. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I move that this committee recommends that the Election and Plebiscites Act be amended to remove the requirement to publish a candidate's or official agent's residential address under sections 96 and 97 and to substitute community of residence. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order. Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, I want to also express my thank you to the committee for doing this work and the Chief Electoral Officer. Um, I do believe that this recommendation has come out of an issue I raised when I was first elected uh, as a single woman living alone. Uh, it was concerning to me to come across my address published on a telephone pole near my house and then later uh, just being able to Google it and find it. Um, so I raised this concern to my colleagues and they brought this forward to the committee and, and the Chief Electoral Officer and I just want to say thank you for that. I, I think it's a really important one, especially given some of the online harassment and such that I've raised in, this, in these sessions. Thank you. Thank you. To the motion. Member for Frame Lake. Or Sure, yeah, the committee had this issue raised by, uh, I think, at least a couple of parties. Uh, I want to thank the, matter, the member for Great Slave for bringing it forward. Um, yeah, most other jurisdictions in Canada do not publish the addresses of candidates, uh, their official agents, uh, or donors. So uh, we uh, need to change that, I think, to protect people's privacy. And that's what this is aimed at, and I support it. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? Uh, opposed? Abstentions? The motion is carried. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. I move that this committee recommends that the Elections and Plebiscites Act be amended to allow Elections NWT to create a register of future electors, allowing youth aged 16 and 17 years old to register with the same information as permitted under Sections 5-4, Bracket 2 of the Act. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Essentially, this just allows 16 and 17 year olds to register and then we can follow them. Often when they go to university, uh, we, we lose them as, as electors and it's, it's good for elections and WT to take this work and get people registered when they're in high school so that when they turn 18, they vote. But this is really a half measure, Madam Chair, and really what this motion should read is that we lower the voting age to 16. Uh, if you vote when you're 16, you are far more likely to vote for the rest of your life. If the first time you vote is 18, 19, or 20, you are far more likely not to vote for the rest of your life. And if we want engaged citizens for our democracy, we should lower the age to 16. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Madam Chair. I echo what my colleague from Yellowknife North just said. I agree that perhaps this hasn't gone far enough. It was uh, amazing to me as I started down the campaign trail how engaged the youth were uh, in our campaign, particularly as it was a record number of women running. Uh, I think that that is a momentum that needs to be built upon. And given the state of the uh, address, or sorry, the electoral list that we do get as MLAs when we do start campaigning. Um, it is not often very up to date, so perhaps this is just the start of some better uh, record keeping on behalf of elections uh, NWT. Thank you. Thank you. To the motion. Member for Frame Lake. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I support this. Um, I'm not sure I'm prepared to go as far as my uh, uh, other Yellowknife uh, uh, colleagues, but uh, um, I think this is a good step in that direction. At least uh, young uh, vote or potential voters will get their, their name into a registry. And when they hit 18, their name just flips over into the other column so that they are then entitled to vote. Um, the you know elections NWT data, the research that they did, showed that about 1,700 people uh, are in the, live in the Northwest Territories aged between 18 and 20, but only 73 of those people voted uh, in the the uh, in the last uh, general election. So um, this is, I think, a way to uh, help improve that. And given that we've also given the Chief Electoral Officer more of a mandate uh, to promote elections uh, in schools and so on, I think we'll see greater participation of youth in the future, and that's why I support this. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is carried. 
Member for Hay River South. Thank you. Ma thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I move that this committee recommends that in implementing the election rebate program authorized under the Election and Plebiscites Act, the Chief Electoral Officer ensure candidates are not able to claim a rebate for any money that they donated to their own campaign that is also eligible for a tax credit from the Canada Revenue Agency. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is carried. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I move that this committee recommends that references to brackets polling station account close bracket be removed from the act and that a provision be added to section 119 bracket 4 that requires any deputy returning officer who appoints a peace officer to state their reasons for doing so in writing to the returning officer as soon as possible thank you madam chair thank you the motion is in order to the motion question has been called all those in favor all those opposed Abstentions. Motion is carried. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that this committee recommends that Section 205, bracket E, of the Election and Plebiscite Act be amended to require that a returning officer include in their report of proceedings any appointments of peace officers made under Section 119, bracket 4 of the Act. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order. To the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Abstentions? Motion is carried. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I move that this committee recommends that the Election and Plebiscites Act be amended to allow an electoral Boundaries Commission to receive information from the Register of Electors under Section 77. Thank you, Madam Chair. The motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Abstentions? Motion is carried. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I move that this committee recommends that the Elections and Plebiscites Act be amended to allow for a candidate's financial report to be submitted within 45 business days rather than 60 calendar days. Thank you, Madam Chair. The motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Abstentions? motion is carried thank you committee do you have agreed that you've concluded consideration of committee report 19 or sorry 9-192 thank you committee we have concluded consideration of committee report 32-19 oh sorry 32-192 <laughs> standing committee on rules and procedures report on the chief electoral officer auxiliary report Issues arising from the 2019 territorial election. What is the wish of committee member for Frame Lake? Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that the chair rise and report progress. There is a motion on the floor to report progress. The motion is in order and non-debatable. All those in favor? All those opposed? <laughs> the motion is carried. I will now rise and report progress.
May I please have the report of Committee of the Whole, member for Neverton Lakes. Mr. Speaker, your committee has been considering Committee Report 32-192 and would like to report progress with eight motions carried and that Committee Report 32-192 is concluded. And Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of Committee of the Whole be concurred with. Thank you. Twin Lakes, do we have a seconder? Member for Decho, all those in favor? <laughs> all those opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is carried. Third reading of bills. Third reading of bills. Mr. Clerk, orders of the day. Orders of the day for Tuesday, October 18th, 2022, 1 30 p.m. Prayer, minister statements, member statements, recognition of visitors in the gallery, reports of committees, and the review of bills, reports of standing and special committees. Returns to oral questions, oral question 1163 192. Acknowledgements, oral questions, written questions, returns to written questions, replies to commissioner's address, petitions, tabling of documents, notices of motion. Motions, notices of motion for the first reading of bills, first reading of bills, second reading of bills, consideration and committee of the whole of bills and other matters. Bills 23, 29, 48, 52, 53, and table documents 528 192 and 654-192, Report of Committee of the Whole, Third Reading of Bills, Orders of the Day. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. This House stands adjourned until Tuesday, October 18th, 2022, at 1.30 p.m. Order.